on World News Tonight. Final goodbyes. Britons queue up across the Thames to pay their respects to Her Late Majesty. Turning the tide. Ukrainians rejoice their victory against captors with Russia losing more ground by the day. Conquering Covid. The light at the end of the tunnel grows brighter for hopes of beating the pandemic. And gorgeous greenery. Lush plants are landscaped to perfection at Sancheon's famous international gardens. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening, thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. The coffin of Queen Elizabeth II left Buckingham Palace for the last time. Born on a horse-drawn carriage and saluted by cannons and the tolling of Big Ben, in a solemn procession through the flag-draped, crowd-lined streets of London to Westminster Hall. There, Britain's longest-serving monarch will lie in state for the world to mourn. As the doors opened, the first of the mourners filled into Westminster Hall to pay their respects to Elizabeth II. They had waited hours for a chance to bow or curtsy or to silently reflect. As the late monarch lies in state, her coffin guarded at every corner, 24 hours a day, by soldiers serving the royal household. She was a, a beautiful inspiration and such a moving energy in there. Closure, our queen is being laid to rest. She's at peace. Among those paying their respects, politicians and dignitaries, including Prime Minister Liz Truss. But most of them everyday Brits, mourning their beloved queen. It was very hard to just see a coffin and not a queen, not our queen. Seeing her like that was, was, was hard. We each of us had the time to stand in front of the coffin on our own not with crowds thick behind us, just on our own for a moment of thought. It was very moving. Outside, the line stretches beyond sight along the Thames for several kilometers as people spend hours and hours waiting to enter the hall. At least a thousand volunteers have been enlisted to help manage the crowds, which are expected to number in the hundreds of thousands in the coming days. The late monarch will lie in state until her funeral on Monday at nearby Westminster Abbey. Until then, the doors of the hall will remain open 24 hours a day. The sadness was shared across the Pacific as Commonwealth citizens and their governments marked the end of the Queen's 70-year reign. But even as King Charles III is still getting comfortable on the throne, Republicans in dominions like Australia are pondering their next move. The current Australian Prime Minister began laying the foundations for a nationwide referendum of transitioning Australia into a republic. In June, he appointed the country's first minister to begin looking into the process. However, he paused his timeline in deference to the Queen and her passing, saying now is the time to pay tribute to her memory, not to push for swift change. He said he will not call a referendum in his current first term as Premier. Polls held earlier in the year showed that two-thirds of Australians would not support King Charles as their monarch. Aboriginal rights are one of the key arguments against dominion rule in the country, with the current Prime Minister working towards recognising First Nations people in the Constitution. The Australian government also said that the image of King Charles III would not automatically replace Queen Elizabeth's on $5 notes, and it may be replaced by Australian figures instead, hinting at a less of a connection to the monarchy in the future. Ukrainians are celebrating with tears as the country's military fights off Russian occupiers and reclaims even more land, allowing those in trapped in areas to reunite with their families. President Zelensky also toured the regions, thanking his forces for their relentless efforts. A dramatic moment on video as a mother is reunited with her son after six months of Russian occupation, said to be in a town near Kharkiv, recaptured by Ukrainian forces. Coming as the White House says another aid package could be on the cards for its ally in a matter of days, and as questions linger over whether Ukraine's counteroffensive marks a turning point 
in the war. The leader of the Russian-backed and self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic says forces loyal to Moscow have pushed back Ukraine's advance in at least one area near the town of Lumen in the eastern Donetsk region. In another town, Izum, recently recaptured by Ukraine, abandoned tanks litter the area emblazoned with the letter Z, the symbol Russian forces use to identify themselves. White House National Security Spokesperson John Kirby. I would let President Zelensky determine and decide whether he feels uh, militarily they've reached a turning point. But clearly, uh, it, it, at least in the Donbass, the, the, there's a sense of momentum here by the Ukrainian armed forces. And so what we're going to do is continue to support them as best we can. President Zelensky himself made a surprise visit to Izum on Wednesday, a major logistics hub about nine miles from the front line. This is what he told journalists in the area as he surveyed the destruction. The view is very shocking, but it's not shock for me because we, we began to see the same pictures from Bucha, from the first deoccupied territories. So the same, destroyed buildings, killed people, and so what can I say? He led a moment of silence in town. Russia, which describes the conflict as a special military operation, denies that its forces have deliberately targeted civilians. Following a serious escalation of the reignited conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan that has killed 155 soldiers from both sides, the two countries negotiated a ceasefire to prevent a further flare-up. Funerals have begun in Azerbaijan, a day after border clashes with Armenia killed scores of soldiers on both sides. The two countries have been fighting over the mountainous area of Nagorno-Karabakh for decades. But this is the deadliest violence between the neighbours since a six-week war killed over 6,500 people in 2020. Armenia said that Azerbaijani shelling had forced at least 2,750 people to flee their homes. We came outside and saw that it was no longer possible to stay in our homes, that serious shelling was taking place. We were very scared. We ran away from the houses to avoid being trapped under the rubble. The ex-Soviet countries have traded blame for the flare-up of hostilities. Uh, it is evident that this new aggression was planned well in advance. Uh, there was a lengthy propaganda campaign uh, spreading uh, most uh, unimaginable allegations of so-called military provocation by Armenia. We've been constantly rejecting those. Armenia has accused Azerbaijan of occupying a pocket of its land seized in Tuesday's clashes and has appealed for help from ally Moscow. Azerbaijan, meanwhile, has received public support from the Turkish president. We find Armenia's violation of the agreement that was reached after the 2020 war resulted with Azerbaijan's victory to be unacceptable. The whole world should know that, as usual, we stand by our Azerbaijani brothers. Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Russia's Vladimir Putin will discuss the fighting when they meet later this week. Russia helped broker a peace deal between Baku and Yerevan two years ago, but Moscow has since been distracted by its war in Ukraine, which may have provided a power vacuum that's rekindled tension. Typhoon Mafia is battering eastern China with powerful gales and torrential rains. The tropical cyclone is the strongest to hit the populated region in over a decade. Powerful gales and torrential rains battered eastern China on Wednesday evening as Typhoon Muifa made landfall in the port city of Zhoshan. Local media are calling it the strongest tropical cyclone to hit the region in a decade. Muifa landed around 8.30 p.m. local time with maximum wind speeds near 94 miles per hour, powerful enough to damage homes, topple trees and power lines. Shanghai, the nation's financial and commercial capital, braced for the storm earlier in the day, canceling trains and flights. It also shut its numerous outdoor COVID-19 testing sites in a rare disruption to an entrenched testing regime since a citywide lockdown was lifted in June. In the eastern province of Zhejiang, more than a million people were relocated ahead of the storm, according to local media. Authorities there issued a red warning for flash floods in several areas, the highest warning level in China's four-tiered typhoon warning system. 
Meteorologists in China say the storm was caused by this year's unusually hot weather and high temperatures in the East China Sea. We have some good news for you. The end is near. Not for humanity, but for the COVID pandemic. This is according to the World Health Organization that confirms that the world is in the best ever position in fighting the pandemic. However, vigilance is crucial to prevent a relapse of infections. The world is now in the best position yet to finally end the COVID-19 pandemic. That's according to the head of the World Health Organization on Wednesday. We have never been in a better position to end the pandemic. We're not there yet, but the end is in sight. His comments marked the agency's most upbeat view yet since it first declared an international emergency more than two and a half years ago. Last week's COVID deaths were the lowest since March of 2020. The virus has killed nearly 6.5 million people and infected more than 600 million after emerging in China in late 2019. It's roiled economies and overwhelmed healthcare systems. Vaccines and therapies have helped stem deaths and hospitalizations, and the Omicron variant and its subvariants have caused less serious disease. Still, WHO chief Tedros Adnam Ghebreyesus urged vigilance, saying countries need to strengthen policies, vaccinate high-risk groups, and keep testing, comparing the effort to running a marathon. We can see the finish line. We are in a winning position. But now is the worst time to stop running. Now is the time to run harder and make sure we cross the line and reap the rewards of all our hard work. With one million COVID deaths this year alone, the pandemic remains a global emergency. The WHO will convene experts in October to decide if the pandemic should remain at its highest level of alert. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. The EU has dealt a significant blow on Google in its latest antitrust claims in court, costing the tech giant approximately $4.1 billion. Google suffered a big setback in the EU on Wednesday. A court ruled the search giant must pay a $4.1 billion penalty for using its Android mobile operating system to thwart rivals. It's a record fine for an antitrust violation. The Alphabet-owned firm had challenged an earlier ruling, but the decision was largely upheld by Europe's second highest court. The European Commission first made the decision about Google four years ago. It said the firm used Android to keep its dominance in general internet search through restrictions and making payments to large manufacturers and mobile network operators. Google said it acted like many other businesses and that such payments and agreements helped keep Android as a free operating system. But the court agreed with the Commission's view. It argued Google imposed unlawful restrictions on manufacturers of Android mobile devices and network operators. Google said it was disappointed by the decision. The ruling is a boost for EU antitrust chief Margrethe Vestager. She has made a crackdown on big tech a key part of her job. She's currently also investigating Google's digital advertising business, as well as other Silicon Valley giants like Meta and Apple. The EU antitrust enforcer has fined Google more than $8 billion over the last decade in three separate investigations. The Swedish Prime Minister has announced that she would resign after an unprecedented right-wing and far-right bloc narrowly won the earlier election. A razor-thin defeat amidst a surge from the far right. As the final votes were tallied, Sweden's centre-left Prime Minister Magdalena Andersson conceded the race and announced plans to resign. The four right-wing parties seem to have about 50% of the votes in the elections, and they have an advantage of several seats. It's a narrow majority, but it's a majority. The right-wing coalition won 176 seats, just three more than the left-wing bloc led by the Prime Minister's Social Democrats. The moderate party leader, Ulf Christensen, said he'd start forming a new government. He'll be relying on the support of the far-right Sweden Democrats, led by Jimmy Åkesson, which is now the second-largest party in Parliament. 
Long a pariah for its roots in the neo-Nazi movement, the party rose to unprecedented popularity with a hardline stance on gang violence and immigration. While they owe the Sweden Democrats for their victory, the moderates are unlikely to include the far-right party in a future government, with their other allies, the Liberals, refusing to accept them. I am proud of the trust we have received, but I am also aware that others are disappointed. There is a large frustration in society, a fear of violence, concern about the economy. The world is very unsure, and the political polarization has been even bigger, even too big in Sweden. Moderate Ulf Christensen is expected to lead a fragile coalition as he tackles Sweden's cost of living crisis and its ongoing bid to join NATO. North Korea has released new propaganda posters featuring its nuclear-tipped ballistic missiles, doing so for the first time in years and after the country codified its nuclear policy. After North Korea enshrined its nuclear policy into law last week, Pyongyang seemed to reaffirm that change by unveiling propaganda posters featuring its nuclear-tipped ballistic missiles for the first time in years. New posters were produced to encourage all officials, party members and other working people to implement the important tasks set forth by the respected comrade Kim Jong-un in his historic policy speech. The posters, released by state news agency KCNA, displayed a number of North Korea's latest missiles, including its Hwasong-15 and Hwasong-17 intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs. In 2018, North Korea removed many anti-American and military-themed posters as Kim engaged in summits with then-U.S. President Donald Trump and other world leaders. Since diplomacy stalled in 2019, however, historical anti-American themes have crept back into public displays. Last week, state media reported that Pyongyang had codified the right to use preemptive nuclear strikes in order to protect itself. Leader Kim Jong-un said in a speech that the law made the country's nuclear policy irreversible and bars any further denuclearization talks. This year, North Korea resumed testing their ICBMs for the first time since 2017. International observers have said it also appears to be readying for a nuclear test. Residents of Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince, sheltered at home as gunfire rang out. Roadblocks and burning tires were placed along city streets and protesters threw stones in an angry response to expected new fuel prices and hikes of crime. Police fired tear gas in a bid to disperse protesters determined to block the capital, Port-au-Prince. Haitians have come back out onto the streets, angry with the government's decision announced on Sunday to cut fuel subsidies. We're sending a message to the Prime Minister that our situation has become untenable. It's the latest in a string of sometimes violent protests across Haiti in response to spiraling inflation at its highest in a decade and chronic gang violence that's left hundreds dead and thousands displaced. Demonstrators accuse Prime Minister Ariel Henry, who's also acting president since last year's assassination of Jovenel Moise, of being responsible for the situation. He must pack his bags and leave immediately. Because of him, I can't eat. I can't pay my rent. Ariel is making me miserable. Ariel, you have to leave your place to someone who can run the country better. In a televised speech on Monday, the Prime Minister repeated his pledge to organize elections as soon as possible, ideally before the end of the year. But the current situation, he said, did not allow for it. Insecurity and gang violence are preventing the free movement of people and goods and threatening the organization of elections. L'organisation des élections. Violence has been particularly rife in the capital around Cité du Soleil, Haiti's largest slum, where murders and kidnappings are on the increase. On Sunday, two young journalists investigating the death of a teenager there were shot dead and their bodies set on fire. On Tuesday, a woman was killed in another district of Port-au-Prince. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute.
Chinese astronauts will carry out a growing number of complex EVAs in a bid to provide more support for the successful completion of the construction and stable operation of the space station Tiangong or Heavenly Palace. Ford Motors unveiled the seventh generation of its Mustang sports car in downtown Detroit, underscoring the challenges Motor City automakers face as they bridge the gap between their combustion glory days and an uncertain electric future. Chinese President Xi Jinping arrived in Samarkand by special flight and began his state visit to Uzbekistan where he will also attend the 22nd meeting of the Council of Heads of State of the Shanghai Corporation Organization. He was warmly greeted by the Uzbek President and other high-level officials. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We leave you tonight with one of Jolna Namdo's province's most famous events, opening doors for the first time in a decade. Thank you for joining us. Good night.